How many of you guys are going to take an Instagram shot of this? <laughs> oh, yeah, I see it. It's happening. Um, it is really cool to sit down with you, Mike, because I interviewed you years ago before you'd sold to Facebook. By the way, he told me they weren't selling, and then they sold. Um, so now that that's out in the open, um, a lot's happened in those years. But I want to go back to when you did sell, right? When you were signing those papers. You have a bunch of entrepreneurs here. Not everyone signs over, you know, signs their company to Facebook for a billion dollars. What was that like? Well, I mean, definitely, even when we were talking, not, in, not on the cards, not in our plan. You know, we had just actually raised another round. We were ready to continue to building it independently. And really, the decision point was that we were going to get to continue to do our own thing and build the company independently. But, I mean, emotionally, it's excitement, mostly shock, and a lot of, we hadn't slept very much for like two years at that point, so at that point we were probably <laughs> running on fumes as well. Um, some trepidation, like hopefully the independence actually does pan out this way, um, and also just like, it's our baby, so you wanna see it continue to thrive and make sure it does. A lot of folks probably in this audience are building out companies. They're at the beginning phases. Um, what advice do you give uh, it, it must look so easy right now, like years later, but what advice do you give at the beginning, the beginning phases? We definitely doubted ourselves a lot in terms of what was the right direction for the company and where to move forward on it. And we were talking earlier about, you know, the bourbon to Instagram pivot is something people talk about a lot, but I think we could have actually done it three or four months earlier. Like nothing that we were doing was really resonating with people. And you can really kid yourself that just throwing more features into whatever you're building is the thing that will tip you. And it, in my experience, never does. Even for products that we've built since then, when we see that something isn't retaining, that people, we can get people in the door, but then they churn out after a week or two, like, it's very hard to bend that retention curve with like tweaks. It's usually something fundamental that either does or doesn't resonate with what you're building. So being bolder about cutting things off when, you know, it's been a few months, it doesn't seem like it's actually resonating. The really interesting thing about today versus when we were getting started is that you can get at least some amount of initial, you know, if you've raised some money, spend some of that in getting at least some people through the door, which was a little harder to do back then. You had the app store, but maybe you would get in the charts, maybe not. But if folks aren't sticking around, there's no amount of app install ads that will fix that. But it's got to be a lot. I would say it's also harder now because there's so much noise. So if, if you've got an app, if you've got one of these, uh, is something you're, you're putting out there, how do you get recognized now? Back when you guys were doing it, it was interesting and it got some traction, but there, it wasn't as crowded. How, how do you get attention now? I think it was also easier because the distribution platforms, like we grew a lot off of people sharing their Instagrams onto Facebook and Twitter and getting the links back and then having our web page at the time basically being like a photo and then a link to download the app. Now there's a few more features, but we started very, very simply then. But yeah, I'm not sure I have a silver bullet for today. It definitely seems a lot harder to have something brand new. And we have the luxury of getting to promote anything new we do like Boomerang from inside Instagram. But so that initial part is still difficult. I mean, at best, if you've raised, you can like at least see if your idea has like enough of an initial user base that will stick around to probably justify like a bigger spend and getting folks in there. But yeah, it is the amount like even just looking outside here and walking through the halls of entrepreneurial and startup activity today, even from five years ago, is nuts. Dealing with very quick growth. Uh, what do you wish you'd known about that? I remember when Instagram shut down, it was, I think, like 2012 or something, that it, there was an outage and everyone was freaking out about it. That was this moment where everyone was like, wow, this is a really powerful service. People are really upset that it's not working. What advice do you have for folks who are dealing with that kind of growth? I think one thing we didn't realize about recruiting early on is that it's not like a faucet you turn on and like even when you're like doing pretty well as we were in 2012, we had so much struggle to actually get people to come work for us and it sounds kind of implausible in retrospect, but I guess you'll have to trust me. But, you know, we were like, oh, we have a jobs page and a form and we hired one recruiter, but it's such a long game because as things have gotten really well in the tech industry, like most, not most people, but a lot of really smart folks want to do their own startups, not come work for your startup. So having like the right connections into people who might be wanting to leave their existing jobs, what we found is that we'd email people and they'd be like, no, sorry, I'm happy where I am. And then six months later, oh, okay, you know, I'm finally ready to do something new, let's go talk. So like, assume a six month lead time for any position you're recruiting for, which means that like, you basically need to be creating those connections. And as first time entrepreneurs, we had no like, oh yeah, I worked with this, these 10 people at my last company, I can bring them into this one, definitely not. So uh, it would have definitely helped deal with the growth and probably prevented some of the outages that we had if we'd actually build out more of that back end team. Now that you guys are at Facebook, how do you maintain kind of that, that culture? Um, 
A lot of folks, even now, a lot of entrepreneurs don't want to go work for Facebook. They want to build their own thing. Look outside here. Um, how do you make sure people know that there's an Instagram culture and you maintain that once you're within? Yeah, it runs from top to bottom. So, I mean, the starting foundation is actually having Zuck and Shrep, the CEO and CTO, on board with that overall plan. But it doesn't happen by magic, even with that. Um, we really do run it as our own company. So every week we have a happy hour with the entire company where we can talk about, they can ask any question they want. And we're small enough where if you have a question, it will get asked and answered. And we're pretty transparent about that. Um, Trivial things like having Instagram swag, I know that sounds trivial, but like again, reinforces like you're working at Instagram, we happen to be part of this larger uh, Facebook umbrella. But overall, like we think of ourselves and talk about ourselves and run ourselves as a company and top to bottom, we have like try to imbue every single person that joins with that sense. We have another onboarding. People are really like onboarded to, you know, till they're tired by the time they join Instagram because they've gone through the Facebook orientation. We're like, I know you just went through six weeks of boot camp please bear with us, we want you to tell you about like what we do differently. But if you don't do that, then you'll just assimilate. And not that assimilation is like all bad, but if you're not intentional about it, you'll lose what made Instagram, Instagram. And I think of it like there's Facebook and what make, Facebook is really good at building Facebook and we're really good at building Instagram and there's different DNA that leads into each of those things. What made Instagram, Instagram? I think we focus a lot on the craft of the product. If you look at it, it doesn't, I'm always proud that we don't have a hamburger menu. Like we haven't tried to build like 50 features. We try to do fewer things really well. And when we look at what to do, we try to take things that are like really limited in the app right now and just completely overhaul them instead of like add yet another thing that you haven't done quite as well. Um, so that like craft and iteration and attention to detail is something that from the beginning, like our Android app, we measure it is the fastest starting Android app out there. And like you don't get that except if you get some engineers that are kind of obsessed about performance and craft. Now, um, when you guys sold, you sold for a billion dollars. And I remember even working in television, everyone was like, oh my god, this startup sold for a billion dollars. It was a huge story. And then Facebook bought some companies for like two billion and 20 billion. Do you ever fear that you sold too early? I think it's funny. Like, it's, I read a lot of science fiction. And like, you can't travel back in time and change the past without dramatically affecting the future. I think a lot of folks are actually riding the enthusiasm that showing what a successful acquisition like ours could look like. I think Facebook definitely saw that in doing the WhatsApp one and the Oculus one as well. And conversely, those companies get a lot more excited about coming to Facebook because they've seen Instagram succeed inside. So I don't think you can tease them apart. But the reason I still get excited is, you know, I still get to work with the people I really care about. My co-founder and I are both still there and having a lot of fun. Um, we still get to run it independently. Um, so no regrets. So you're never like, man, you could have waited like another year and sold for like... You can't, you'll, it's like the <laughs> killing your own father. You can't, it's an, an impossible. Talk to me a little bit. The dynamic with your co-founder is very important for any startup. Um, this will make or break a startup. Um, and you see a lot of nasty breakups. But you're in a very happy relationship with your, your, co, your co-founder. What is the dynamic like with Kevin? I think what worked for us, we like prototyped, we're both like, I guess, designers at heart. We prototyped our relationship before actually getting married. Because <laughs> got me a co-founder is like getting married effectively. Uh, we would basically meet at coffee shops, pretend we were working on a totally different startup and just work for an, an evening and then like have something built at the end. And at the end, I was like, well, this guy, like we both know what we're doing, which is a good starting point. But we both like each other too. Like we are two of the lowest drama people that I've ever met, which is so key when building a company. And we, neither of us want each other's jobs. Like Kev loves a lot of the more company building stuff, likes being out there in the press. I love the geeky engineering sort of internal company building side and like that complementary nature. Like in, even in the midst of having grown the company a lot and having like over 200 people and Instagram now, like it's really nice still having a core that like you can close the door and like, like, whew, all right, that was a tough meeting. Like, let's regroup and, and get ready to go. Failure is such a big part of entrepreneurship. I know sometimes in the media we don't do as good of a job as talking about the dark stuff and all the failures as we do celebrating the successes. Were there ever any moments? I mean, it must be so, it looks like really easy now, but I'm sure those first couple of years, were there any, uh, any moments and specific ones where you just closed the door and you thought, I gotta, I, we're gonna shut off the lights. Like, this really might not work. Yeah, I mean, take I, us to your like lowest, lowest point. When was it? I think it was. So we had a really bad outage in April 2012, and at that point we had maybe 10 to 15 million people on the site, and uh, this big wind or no, rainstorm blew through Virginia. And if any of you host your stuff on Amazon, you know that there's an Amazon Virginia data center. Knocked out the power. Their backup power failed. So basically, all of Instagram went off, and we had to basically like reassemble it, like the Legos had all fallen on the floor, and like build it back up from from that over 
36 hours, which like we just didn't sleep. We just and there were three of us because we sucked at hiring. So uh, that combination of things was really really brutal. And like you know, people were like externally kind of making fun of us. Like uh, I did a medium article about like some of the things I've learned on engineering. There's a meme image from the time that like was really annoying at the time, but it's kind of funny in retrospect, which is this guy that's like, Instagram is down, just describe your brunch to me. And like, <laughs> the people on the outside are like, what are these clowns doing that they can't keep the site up? Like, why weren't, I love also the second guessers that come out and then they're like, why Instagram should have been in multiple data centers. I'm like, give us a break, we're three people. Like, we're just trying to like do this thing and, and keep it alive. So um, that was definitely the lowest. And like, especially after 30 hours, I like developed a back cramp. So I was like coding on my side like pushing the cat like on the floor, uh, getting the site back up. And then, um, so mostly just like, you feel a sense of responsibility when you've grown something and people really want to use it. And when ultimately you're the thing getting in the way of that, like nothing is more motivating than that. Yeah. Um, so we, it's been like a crazy, you guys are celebrating your five years, right? Yeah. Um, it's been a crazy five years for you. So let's look at the next five years. Um, what does Instagram look like? And, and you can be like as crazy as possible. I mean, I know Facebook has bought like everything recently. So like you, I'm, I'm allowing you to like tap into all the things that they bought and anything you want to do. Um, what does Instagram look like in five years? Yeah, I think it's been actually really fun. We just opened our first engineering office in New York. So we have a non like California presence for the first time. And it happens to be where the, or FAIR, which is the Facebook AI research lab is. So we've started doing interesting things around how they can do their crazy convolutional neural network stuff and what that means for Instagram, either in terms of organizing. We get 80 million photos a day. So how do we organize that? And how do we sort through that in interesting ways? Um, and then obviously there's Oculus as well. Um, and you know, I, what I get really excited about at the core, because those are technologies I like to think of in terms of like products and needs and problems that we're solving. Like the thing I'm excited about is just teleporting yourself anywhere in the world through Instagram. You can kind of sort of do it if you know how to use like the search and put the right city in there, but it's like, V0.1 of it. But imagine you could at any point say, like, what's it like in Paris right now? What's going on there? Like, I want to basically be as close to being there as possible. You know, you can imagine a VR experience there. You can imagine a, more of a simple phone experience there. But overall, like, we have to do something about letting you experience the world. You probably see about 150 photos on Instagram a day. There are 79, whatever, a million other ones that you could be experiencing it if only we did a better job around discovery. So that's what I get really excited about. Hopefully you, five years from now, it's like... Are yeah. you guys talking with the folks from Oculus at all? Do they like kind of wander over to your little place on campus and you guys have these nice conversations? We do, yeah. Well, they usually invite us over. They're like, oh, check out the latest demo. And then right. they're like, oh my God, this is the future. Um, <laughs> uh, if you guys haven't, by the way, there's like, I think an Oculus demo area that is completely worth doing. Um, yeah, it's, uh, we've talked to them a few times. I think it's still early. Like, I keep saying we're a small team. We keep getting bigger, but I still feel like we're like, understaffed for all the different things that we're trying to do. But um, it would be really exciting to do in the future because people associate Instagram with being out in the world and capturing things that are interesting. So combining that with experiencing things that are interesting would be phenomenal. What do you look for? What, when someone comes and, says, and interviews for a job, what is like the number one thing you look for in, in hiring? Well, it's really interesting for us because we mostly recruit out of Facebook's boot camp. So in one sentence, basically, Facebook hires into the Facebook Inc. kind of family of apps and, 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 and experiences, and you spend eight weeks choosing a team to work on. So it's this bizarre experience where like, you assume people have cleared the technical bar, right? They're really good at interviewing, but now you have to figure out if they're right for you and you're right for them. It's, a buy, it's almost like matching if you're a doctor, right? And to me, what I found over time is like, passion for things beyond engineering. This is specifically engineering because I spend most of my time yeah. recruiting engineers, but you'll get people that are like, what are, you, what are you excited about? They're like, Python. I'm like, all right, what else are you excited about? They're like, C++. Like the people who are like, oh yeah, you know, like I am really interested in tinkering with knitting. There's people who are really into knitting and like they have their passions or they've gone deep on something. They're musicians. Like I find A, it helps them balance out all the craziness of work with something that is tangible that they can go home to. And B, like they'll often bring insights like, oh, I played on a sports team, and here's a metaphor about how we're tackling this problem that I find. So that curiosity of things beyond just, you know, it's actually not engineering prowess. It's being an interesting person, I guess. Um, Instagram's still growing so quickly. Um, and also less teenagers getting on Facebook, lots of teens on Instagram. One day, does Instagram get bigger than Facebook? I mean, I guess it doesn't matter because they bought you guys, but could that happen? I don't know. I guess it approaches a limit. Yeah. yeah I, I look around the world, and there's places that we have so much work to do to be better at. So 
look at places with low connectivity that are just coming online. Or I'm from Brazil. Every time I go home to Brazil, I'm like, ah, like 3G has such a long way to go before it's like as as fast as it needs to be for Instagram to be good. So in the meantime, we need to make our product work a lot better there, making it easier to onboard people for the first time. It's one of the challenges is. I've had an Instagram account now for almost six years, right? Uh, so I haven't gone through the New Year's experience in a while, and I finally did because I signed up for like a, my dog's account. I signed up for my dog's account, and I was like, oh, look, all these things that we could be doing differently, but you lose sight of it because you're so much you know, used to the way things are. So yeah, like growth is going really well, but you know, Facebook has shown that there, there is at least a billion plus people interested in using something like this in the world. We have 400 million, which I know sounds ridiculously large, but I always feel like there's more to do. So that was a yes or a no? That was a yes. I think we can get as, as big as Facebook. <laughs> cool. Um, when I you don't see a reason why not. I think it's so visual that like, you know, I think most people can see the appeal of something that's inherently visual. Um, so when you talk about, you like it when other people have other hobbies, right? When you're, in, when you're trying to hire someone, an engineer who likes to knit or whatever it is, right? Yeah. Um, what's yours? Music. Music is mine. So I wish I got more time to do it, but I've been... Uh, rescuing myself from the day-to-day -day by going off and playing guitar alone in a room for a few hours for many years, and it's very therapeutic, I think. Um, so I think we're out of time. That's going to start blinking. I'm going to ask one more question before they get mad at me. Um, so if you could leave a room full of entrepreneurs with any bit of anything, um, these people are going to be building out companies, failing, succeeding, all sorts of things. Um, as someone who's in Silicon Valley, surrounded by the most influential people, and I'm kind of on, on the top at this point, what do you tell these folks? I think a lot of Instagram worked because of the people we surrounded ourselves with. So be it as co-founders or with, you know, we were really fortunate to have great investors that were really grounded. I like to say about investors, like, find ones that will either be really additive or really neutral. The ones that feel like they're going to be high beta are like the ones to avoid. Uh, we were lucky to find people that were really additive, like Matt Kohler from Benchmark. So, like, ultimately, like, you're going to have the days where, like, everything is going to fall apart and you don't know if things are going to go forward. And having, like, a shoulder to lean on was effectively your co-founder spouse. Uh, that, I think, made the difference for us. Great. Wonderful. Thanks right. so much. Thanks, Lori.